it came rather hard to start with to obey commands. But gradually, we knew how to form fours, right wheel, left wheel, halt, and all the rest of them. Uh, we became, in other words, a disciplined body of men. They learned the rituals of another way of life. They had all the eagerness in the world to impel their learning. Fixing bayonets is one of the one, most wonderful things in the army. The story goes that the sergeant major was telling the troops how to fix, our, fi fix bayonets. And he said, when I says fix, you don't fix. But when I says bayonets, you whip them out and whop them on. The new armies learned their trade, despite every kind of difficulty, without discouragement. Not only uniforms were in short supply, but tents and huts and blankets and almost every single thing that a soldier needs. There were battalions dressed in uniforms of surplus postman's blue. Through a bleak winter, they had little beyond their own high hope and courage to keep them warm. The old soldiers who taught them to drill also taught them other things which were part of the army's way of life. As early as September 1914, people living near Aldershot were astonished and rather shocked to hear a new song on the lips of soldiers route marching along the roads and lanes. When the words of this song were printed in a letter to the Times, slightly amended for the benefit of tender readers, another correspondent quickly wrote, Your correspondent has unconsciously placed a weapon in the hands of the German press. Send out my mother, my sister and my brother, but for goodness sake don't send me. Think how this will read, duly translated into German. Impelled by the passionate will of the nation behind them, a nation still barely acquainted with the meaning of total war, the new armies drew towards readiness. Some regular soldiers frankly despised them. Sir Henry Wilson, a GHQ, for one. Under no circumstances can these mobs take the field for two years. Then what is the use of them? Kitchener's ridiculous and preposterous army of 25 corps is the laughing stock of every soldier in Europe. It took the Germans 40 years of incessant work to make an army of 25 corps with the aid of conscription. It will take us to all eternity to do the same by voluntary effort. Bearing the proud badges of their old and famous regiments, serious, determined, and a little apprehensive, the young soldiers took their departure. In the middle afternoon, the outer parts of the town of embarkation were reached, the band recommenced playing, and at the attention and in excellent step, they passed through the suburbs, the town centre, and so towards the docks. The people of that town did not acclaim them, nor stop about their business, for it was late in the second year. And so to France. The swelling numbers of the British Army sufficiently proclaimed that an enterprise of great pith and moment was at hand. 100,000 men in August 1914, 350,000 by January 1915, just over one million by February 1916. Still they came. By June, one and a half million. People of France took note of their arrival. 
On the pavements, as they marched by, women in deep black observed them with particular attention. When the British army attained the million mark, the Battle of Verdun was only nine days old. By the end of March, Verdun was 40 days old and had already displayed incomparable savagery. By the end of April, France had been bleeding to death for 70 days. In June, new heights of ferocity were reached and a hundred days of Verdun had passed by. The French people looked thoughtfully at the young British soldiers. The French government and their generals looked towards the new British commander-in-chief, Sir Douglas Haig. When Haig was appointed, he told Joffre's liaison officer, I pointed out that I am not under General Joffre's orders, but that would make no difference, as my intention was to do my utmost to carry out General Joffre's wishes as if they were orders. It had already been decided in 1915 that the Allies should shape their 1916 strategy as a joint, simultaneous effort, a gigantic pressure from all fronts at once against the Central Powers. There had never been any doubts that the British Army would take part in a massive offensive in 1916. But now, week by week, month by month, as Verdun dragged on, the project assumed a new significance. It was not so much now a matter of smashing Germany, it was becoming a question of saving France. Haig's dilemma was acute. At the end of March, he told Lord Kitchener, I've not got an army in France, really, but a collection of divisions untrained for the field. The actual fighting army will be evolved from them. For these reasons, says Haig, I desired to postpone my attack as long as possible. Haig was fighting for time. Then, on May the 24th, Joffre's liaison officer told him, Owing to the great losses of the French at Verdun, which would soon reach 200,000, General Joffre was of the opinion that the offensive cannot be delayed beyond the beginning of July. Two days later, Joffre came in person to hammer the point home. The French had supported for three months alone the whole weight of the German attack at Verdun. If this went on, the French army would be ruined. He therefore was of the opinion that the 1st of July was the latest date for the combined offensive of the British and French. I said that before fixing the date, I would like to indicate the state of preparedness of the British Army on certain dates and compare its condition. I took 1st and 15th July and 1st and 15th August. The moment I mentioned August the 15th, Joffre at once got very excited and shouted, the French army would cease to exist if we did nothing till then. Haig agreed to attack on July the 1st, accepting that his army would be unready. The place was known, the Somme, where the British and French armies met. The date was fixed, July the 1st. The tempo of preparation accelerated. There were 35 days to go. The new steel helmets were issued and dubiously received. One million had been delivered in France by July. We've all been served out with a new shrapnel helmet. Now we look like so many Tweedledees. The tin hats are about the limit in ugliness, just like an inverted dish cover or tin basin. When it comes to wearing them, they're about as uncomfortable as they can be. For all these newcomers in their new world across the water, it was time to learn the disciplines of wars. As the strange hardships and novelties of its trade presented themselves, the citizen army rearranged its thoughts. These were situations beyond what they had expected, beyond the ordinary range of communication. They devised new forms of words and set them to old tunes. A water life, a water life, living in a trench. A water life, a water life, fighting for the French. We haven't got a wife for a nice little wench. We're all quite happy in an old French trench. Dear Auntie, this leaves me in the pink. We are, at present, wading in blood up to our necks. Send me fags and a life belt. 
Satisfying jokes were devised along these lines. Dear mother, this war's a bugger. Sell the pig and buy me out. John. Dear 